You ready? Let's go. Shake it up. All right, let's see if we get here nice and shaky and shaky and shaky. Not that it really matters, but here we go. All right, let's put it here today. First question. Mine. Can you go over entropy? That's a perfect grip. Oh, let's go over entropy. I went over it twice. <laughs> All right, next question. No. Let's go over entropy. Entropy oh, is the state of disorder of a system. For example, if I have a little pile of papers. Why are you so good at ripping paper? <laughs> it's the paper. I have years of practice. I'm going to throw my region on the floor and walk over it. You know, it's all entropy. They've ripped in the most lazy spots. Duh. Okay. It's messy. This system has got very low entropy. There are separate pieces of paper. That's true. There are separate pieces of paper, but these separate pieces of paper are stacked in a neat and orderly way. Kind of like the solid phase with atoms arranged in a regular crystal lattice. Graphite. Or graphite. Go ahead. Graphite. Ugh, ugh. All right. This is what happens when you get into a fight with a graph. Graphite. Anyway, it doesn't take very much energy at all. Nature tends to do this automatically. Things tend to go towards a messier state. It doesn't take much energy to do it. Now, it takes a lot of energy to reverse that trend and put it all back together again. Entropy is a state of disorder. Which phase has got the lowest entropy? Sleep. Sleep. Okay, let's go over what entropy is again. Entropy is a state of disorder. Yes. Which phase has the lowest amount of disorder? Solid. In fact, solids, the molecules are arranged in a regularly shaped form that we call what? Crystal lattice, right? This is incredibly well ordered. Not disordered at all. Very <laughs> low entropy. What phase has very high entropy? Gas. That's a gas. Where well, the molecules spread all over the place. Do I have any of my hair? Second question. Can you explain how to know when a mixture is saturated or unsaturated? Absolutely. This goes back to reference table G. Table G is the solubility table that tells you how many grams you have per 100 grams of water at various temperatures. And it's represented by a curve. If you match up the grams you have dissolved and the temperature you have it dissolved at and it ends up over the line, that would make it super saturated. Super saturated. If you match up the grams and the temperature and you end up under the line, Un unsaturated. unsaturated. But if you match up US. the grams and the temperature and they land up exactly saturated. on the line, saturated. that's when you have a saturated solution. So based on reference table G, as long as you've got 100 grams of water, you're good to go. If you don't have 100 grams of water, just use a proportion. Like if we had 50 grams of water, just double the amount you have and that'll tell you how much you can dissolve per 100 grams. Remember, twice as much water can dissolve twice as much stuff. So that's how to use reference table G. Next up. Great. Can you go over more equilibrium questions? Sure, okay. There's only a couple things you need to know about equilibrium. One of them is, what has to be equal at equilibrium? No, not everything, just one thing. The rate of what? Forward and reverse. Forward and reverse change. The rates of the forward and reverse change have to be equal at equilibrium. Nothing else has to be equal. The only thing that has to be equal at equilibrium are the rates of the forward and reverse change. Nothing else has to be equal. The amounts don't have to be equal, just the rates have to be equal. Now, 
That being said, let's suppose we had this equilibrium where we have a gas uh, plus 2b gas plus heat forms 2c gas. So what's going to happen is a is going to get used up, b is going to get used up, and we're going to make c. Now, if this reaction went to completion, we'd use up all of our reactants and make products. And by the time we were done, we'd have nothing of this and all of that. If the arrow went in the other direction, what that would tell us is that C is decomposing into A and B. And after the reaction is done, we'll have no more C left, and we'll have all A and B. But if this reaction reaches equilibrium, actually, this reaction would never reach equilibrium. A, B, C, okay. look, it's not balanced, or it's easy. No, it's not that. It's that this reaction is endothermic, which is not favored and it decreases in entropy, which is also not favored. Since both factors are not favored, this reaction would never reach equilibrium. So this is a terrible example. Let's try a better example. The, the, the entropy decreases and it's endothermic. That'll never reach equilibrium. This one will. N2 gas plus 3H2 gas forms an equilibrium with 2 NH3 gas plus heat. Now, the reason why this reaction will reach equilibrium, entropy decreases. That's not favored. But it's exothermic. That is favored. And as long as one factor is favored and the other is not favored, you can reach equilibrium. So this is a good example right here. You can mess with an equilibrium. You can go in there and actually tweak this equilibrium to make it do what you want. Let's say, for example, you open up this container that it's enclosed in, and you add more H2. If you add more H2, you're going to get more collisions between H2 and N2. That's going to make this forward reaction go forward faster. faster. Now, imagine you're on a treadmill. You're just walking on a treadmill like this, and all of a sudden the treadmill speed doesn't change at all, but you start to walk faster. Which way are you going to go? Forward. forward. So what that does is it makes the equilibrium shift forward because the forward change is going to go faster than the reverse change. Now, eventually over time, that will slow down and reach equilibrium again, but before it does, these guys will get used up and you'll make more of that. So as a result of adding H2, you'll use up the extra H2 you added. Can't use up the H2 without also using up the N2. Imagine you're going to make blueberry pancakes. You can't make blueberry pancakes without using up both blueberries and pancake batter. So when you use up the pancake batter, you're also using up blueberries and making more blueberry pancakes. It's sort of like, oh my gosh, I just found some more pancake mix. I got to use it up. So you use up the pancake mix to make the pancakes, and you use up the blueberries at the same time. Can't make blueberry pancakes without the blueberries and the pancake batter. Banana pancakes. Uh, yeah, those are pretty good too. So, oh, but you have to add nutmeg to the mix. You listen to the song. Nutmeg okay. and vanilla extract. So Le Chatelier's principle, an equilibrium will shift away from what you add and will shift towards whatever you remove. And the resulting stress, the stress will result in a shift which will change everybody's concentration. Yeah. For example, if we remove NH3, the equilibrium will shift to bring NH3 back up in that direction, again, using those guys up. Could you go over this question? You had to ask. Throw it out. Throw it out. Just waste our time. Unbelievable. What is the correct name for the acid H3PO4? No. <laughs> oh, no. I don't know. <laughs> Who asked that question? What is the correct name for H3PO4? It's actually a really good question because if you don't remember how to name acids, it was too all you have to do is go to reference table K, common acids, and you'll find H3PO4 right down there, and it says its name is phosphoric acid. So if you run into a situation where you don't remember the name of an acid, just look it up. It's right there on reference table K. They couldn't possibly make it easier for you. Well, they could. They could, like, whisper it in your ear while you're taking the test, but technology hasn't got to that point yet. This might take a while.
<laughs> Me Chan apostrophe sm. Mechanism! Yes. Okay, I got you. Mechanism. The mechanism is a series of steps that reactions take on their way from reactants to products. Now, the only thing you've got to know about mechanism is this. A catalyst removes steps from the mechanism, which is what makes the reaction go faster. An inhibitor adds extra steps to the, cat to the uh, mechanism, which makes the reaction go slower. And that's as far as mechanism goes. You're not going to actually have to put together an example mechanism for the reaction. Awesome. Yep. Next question. Why are some metals more able to react than others? This comes down to what's called quantum mechanics. The simplest explanation is this. Do metals gain electrons or lose electrons? They gain. They lose. <laughs> they lose. They, they lose. lose electrons. Why? What a loser. A it all well, they do form a positive charge, but it all comes down to electronegativity. Describe the electronegativity of a metal compared to a nominal. It's much lower, which means it has a lower attraction to electrons. Now, if your metal has only one energy level versus a metal having two energy levels versus a metal having three energy levels versus a metal having four energy levels. Which one of these metals is it going to be easier to take an electron away from? The first one. The second one. No, the last one. Because the electron is farther away, from. farther away from what it's attracted to. Remember, the closer two oppositely charged things are, the stronger their attraction is going to be. Here we have a very strong attraction to the nucleus. As you get further away, not only is this electron getting further from the nucleus, but there's also all these other negative electrons in between. Opposites attract, but what do like charges do? Detract. They repel. Detract. They detract. They detract from the ability to attract. So anyway, not only is the distance from the nucleus much greater, making it less attractive, but you have what's called a shielding effect. The negative electrons actually shield that outermost electron from the nucleus. So the reason why some metals are more active than others is that the valence electron gets further away from the nucleus. Now, that doesn't explain lithium. Lithium only has two energy levels, and yet it is the most active metal of all. The reason why lithium is the most active metal at all, even though that kind of flies in the face of all this, I haven't got the slightest idea. Again, it comes down to quantum effects, and it kind of goes beyond where I am and my knowledge of quantum physics, which is next to nothing. Otherwise, I'd be like hooked up to a wheelchair with a computer screen talking, this is quantum mechanics, but you know. Doppler. I always find it interesting that Stephen Hawking is from England, but his computer simulation has got an American accent. It's weird. When are diatomic molecules significant? This is a good question. Guys, when you need to complete a reaction, like let's say this, Na plus H2O forms NaOH plus that. And there's going to be a 2 in front of that. So. <laughs> If you take a look at this reaction, you got two sodiums on the left, two sodiums on the right, four hydrogens on the left, but only two hydrogens on the right. What's got to go in here to take care of that? Two. Not two, but H2. See the two missing hydrogens. And that's when diatomic molecules come in handy. If Brinkelhoff, if any of the Brinkelhoff molecules, B R I N C L O H O or F, are by themselves, they're diatomic. They're Twinkie molecules. They come two to a pack. Next question. Next question. Lego. My ego. Lego. Can you explain how to make isomers of hydrocarbons? Yes. Isomer. <laughs> That is butane. This molecule has how many carbons? 
four. And how many hydrogens? And okay. There's one way we can rearrange this so that we could still have four carbons and still have ten hydrogens, but be a different structure. What you can do to make an isomer of a straight chain hydrocarbon is take one of the carbons off the end and make it into a methyl. Once more in slow motion. If you want to make an isomer from a straight chain hydrocarbon, remove the carbon from the end. Oh, you ruined it! And place it in the middle as a methyl group. Count them up, you'll find you still have four carbons and ten hydrogens. Next question. How can you tell if something is a covalent bond? Now, we did do covalent bonds yesterday, but here's the quick and easy way of telling if you have a covalent bond. Quick and dirty way. Quick and dirty way, sure. If you've got two non-metal atoms bonded to each other, it's a covalent bond, period. If you've got hydrogen bonded to any one of these, it's covalent. If you've got any one of these bonded to any other one of these, it's covalent, period. Next End of story. Non-metal to non-metal, covalent. Next question. Next question. Entropy. Been there, done that. Next question. Bought the t-shirt, burned it. Increased its entropy. Next question. What is an element? Are you serious? No. Are you serious? Actually, it's, it's a legitimate question. An element is a substance which... It's on the periodic table. An element is a substance which cannot be decomposed into any simpler substance. You can take water and break it down into hydrogen and oxygen. You can take this... You can take this molecule and break it down into carbon and hydrogen. But an element can never be broken down into anything simpler. Gallium is the simplest form of gallium that there is. So that's what an element is. It's a substance that cannot be decomposed any further. Next question. We're almost out of them. Activity series. Okay, we already kind of did that with the why are some metals more active than others, but just to kind of put a picture on it, any metal that's higher up is going to be more active, undergo oxidation, is going to be the anode of a battery, is going to be the negative end of the battery. The other metal, the one that's lower down, will be the reduct will be reduced, be the cathode, and the positive end of your battery. Where the heck is wall drug? <laughs> Can we go over equilibrium and spontaneous reactions? Well, wall drug is located in Wall, South Dakota. And we've already gone over equilibrium, but let's do spontaneous reactions because they are related. Nature favors two things. A negative change in potential energy, that's an exothermic reaction, and a positive change in entropy. Anything that has both of these characteristics will be spontaneous. Anything with the opposite characteristics will be non-spontaneous. Any reaction where one is favored and the other isn't can reach equilibrium. Good. And that's really what it comes down Good. to. Next question. Last question. How can you make a picture worth a lot less than a thousand words? <laughs> Use the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry's methodology for making the name of a compound. For example, this picture right here. Good question, man. This is awesome. <laughs> That's three, one, the three. name of this molecule is pentane. There's a methyl of three carbons in, three methyl, two chlorines on the first car on the second carbon, two, two, dichloro. That is fewer than a thousand words.